is Eyal Kalai from Microsoft, Microsoft Research and MIT. Okay, so thank you very much for hanging out till the better end of the day. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about the problem of delegating computation, which is kind of one of my favorite problems that I've been obsessed with for many years. And we have an interesting connection to no signaling strategies, which is a concept from quantum mechanics. Okay, so let's start. So, you know, in recent years, the way we do computations is really changing. Uh, now it's kind of time of kind of big data. We have huge amount of data. Uh, we have a lot of very weak uh, devices. And often we store our data elsewhere. We even outsource our computation elsewhere, let's say, to a cloud. And this raises many new challenges. Uh, and you know, as always, with new challenges come new uh, ideas and new mathematical tools are developed. So this is all great. So what are the challenges that uh, are raised? So the first one clearly is that of privacy. We're concerned with the privacy of our data. Uh, and we need to deal with that when our data is uh, stored elsewhere. The other uh, problem is that, the other concern is that of integrity. And this is what I'm going to focus on today. So what is the problem of integrity? We outsource the computations. But how do we know that the cloud did the computations correctly? Okay, so here's, let me explain the problem that we're dealing with a bit more precisely. So here is the problem. We have a weak device here, a smartwatch, that wants to do a computation but does not have the computational resources to do so. So he delegates this computation to a powerful server, say some cloud. So suppose he wants the cloud to compute a function f on input x for at most t time steps. And he wants the cloud to give back the answer of the computation y together with a proof of correctness. Okay, because he wants to verify that the, he wants to be able to verify that y is indeed the correct answer. This is our goal. Now, of course, importantly, the verifier, the smartwatch, should be able to verify the proof efficiently, in particular in time significantly shorter than t, the time it takes to do the computation. Otherwise, he would have done it by himself in the first place. Okay, so this is crucial. And it turns out, the way we currently think about proofs, this is impossible. Okay, I still have probably about 43 minutes left, so I'm not going home yet. Uh, what we'll show in this talk is how to get around this impossibility result. And interestingly, we have two magic ingredients that we use to get around this negative result. First ingredient is the magic of cryptography. And the second ingredient is ideas from quantum mechanics. Now, let me pause here and note that the problems I'm trying to solve actually have nothing to do with cryptography or quantum mechanics. So I'm not concerned about secrecy here at all even though it is a concern and you can build, put cryptography on top to get secrecy, but this is not the focus of this talk. So I'm not concerned about secrecy. The functions that I'm delegating here are classical. You could think of delegating quantum computation, but this is not the focus of this talk. Classical computation, no secrecy. Still, I'm so gonna solve this problem using crypto and uh, ideas uh, from quantum mechanics, in particular the idea of no signaling strategies. Sorry, the, some of the slides I see are cut off, so I'll just replace what's missing. Okay, so uh, let's begin. So in order to explain uh, better the, um, uh, how we delegate computation, I first need to explain what do I mean by a proof. Okay, so we want the cloud to give a proof. What is a proof? Now I know I'm talking here to a bunch of mathematicians who probably know what a proof is, but in this talk, we're going to think of a proof a little differently than what we think of as classically. So in the first part of the talk, I'm going to do kind of a brief overview, too brief overview, of the evolution of proofs in computer science, how we think about proofs. And then we're going to show how to use this to solve our problem of delegating computation. 
Okay, so by the way, as I'm going, uh, progressing my talk, if there's something that I'm saying that, you know, some amusing word that you're not familiar with, just raise your hand and I'll explain myself. Okay. <clears throat> So, you know, we've been thinking about proof for a thousand years. Already mathematicians and ancient, uh, ancient Greek mathematicians have thought about proofs. And after thousands of years of thinking about proofs, this is how we think of proofs. It's a piece of paper, there are many pieces of papers, where you verify the proof kind of line by line and you verify correctness. Okay, and of course this in inspired uh, Cook and Levin in the mid-70s to define the class NP, which is a class of computation, or languages actually, that can be, membership can be verified efficiently via a classical proof, efficiently of course for us computer science is polynomial time, that's how we define efficiently. And one of the most important uh, problems in uh, computer science today is whether P is not equal to NP. But it turns out that if you want to use classical proofs, that you know, many functions that are computable in time t are believed to actually n not have a classical proof that's verifiable in time significantly less than t. Okay, so we cannot verify computation in time significantly less than the time it takes to carry out the computation in general, we believe. And that's why we get this impossibility result, that we cannot delegate computation. So what do we do? Well, we need to change, we need to kind of bypass, right? So the way we do it, we change the model. Let's think about proofs differently. And the way we think about proofs changed dramatically in the mid 80s with the introduction of interactive proofs by Goldwasser, Mikali, and Rakoff. So uh, they were motivated by cryptography. What they wanted to construct is what's called zero-knowledge proof, which is beautiful on its own. I'm not going to talk about it today. We're not concerned with zero-knowledge or hiding at all. But this model is very useful for us as well. So what is this model? They said the following. You know what? Instead of thinking of just one message from the prover to the verifier, and that's it, you know, here's the proof, let's think of it as an interactive process between the prover and the verifier. So verifier has questions, prover gives answer, and this goes on back and forth many rounds. Moreover, the verifier tosses coins. He can toss coins throughout this interaction. And what's required is that soundness is only required to hold with very high probability. So there is a tiny probability that a prover can cheat and convince you the correctness of an incorrect statement. But this holds with probability, you know, two to the minus a thousand, okay? As, long, as small as you want, over the randomness of the verifier. So you can cheat, but with very, very small probability. Okay, so this is the model of interactive proofs. And what's interesting to us, it turns out shortly after this model was introduced, it turned out that these proofs seem to be much more powerful than standard proofs. In particular, here's an example. I uh, suppose I want to prove to you here that the black player has a winning strategy. I don't know how to do using classical proof, because I need to prove that for every move of the white, there's a move of the black, so that for every move of the white, uh, I don't know how to prove this succinctly. But with an interactive proof, I do know how to do it, where the verifier's runtime is very short. And more generally, what's, what's known is that any computation can be verified where the runtime of the verifier is proportional to the space needed to do the computation. Okay, and often the space is much, much shorter than the runtime, as in this example. This example that the space required to do the computation is very small. Okay, so the, again, the, the verifier needs to run in time proportional to the space. Wonderful, so for small space computation, we have proofs, you know, with efficient verifiers. Okay, but actually we can even do better. So shortly after that model was introduced, Benno Goldwasser, Mikalian, and uh, Kilian, and Victor Zon, sorry, introduced the model of multi-prover interactive proof. Again, they were motivated by zero knowledge. This time they wanted to do zero knowledge in the information theoretic setting before they only got a computational version. But again, this is, another story. For our story, what, what's important is the model. So here's the model they introduced. They said, why restrict to one prover? Suppose we had two provers. Okay, still one verifier, he still tosses coins, but now he talks to the two provers. He gives each one a query, each one looks at their query, computes an answer. And now, but 
here's the soundness condition. They require the soundness hold, assuming these provers do not communicate at all. So they answer their queries locally. So prover one sees only query one, responds, and similar to Q2. And what was shown shortly after this model was introduced, that actually this model is extremely powerful. Actually, any classical proof can be kind of made exponentially shorter in this model. Or put a little uh, more precisely, what was shown, take any function that is computable in time t, you can, uh, a two-prover can convince a verifier of the correctness of this computation, where the runtime of the verifier, okay, he needs to read the input, which is x, but otherwise it grows only polylogarithmically with t. Okay, so the overt is polylog t, which is fantastic, and the communication is just polylog t. So this is fabulous, it's very, very powerful. And intuitively, just to say kind of a word, intuitively, why is this model so powerful? So think of, you know, think of suspects, of two, two suspects that committed a crime. If you have two suspects, you put them in different rooms and you interrogate them, it's much easier to find them kind of, in a to, you know, find a place where they're inconsistent as opposed to just a single suspect. And this is essentially what's going on behind the scenes here. The multi-prover interactive proofs, essentially they do a bunch of consistency check. And if you try to cheat, they'll find kind of place where these two provers are inconsistent. Okay, so what did we see so far? We had the classical proofs, we had interactive proofs, we had multi-prover interactive proofs, and I wish I had more time to tell you more because this is not the end of the story. This led to a beautiful line of work on probabilistically checkable proofs, which you know, create a whole branch of hardness of approximation and really, really wonderful results, which I will not have time to tell you about. Instead, we're gonna go back to our problem of delegating computation. Okay, so let's go back after we did this detour. Here's our weak device, wants to delegate this function f to the cloud. He wants the cloud to provide him a proof of correctness. And what do we want? Let's go slowly over the efficiency requirements that we want. So we want the verifier to be very efficient, ideally with polylogarithmic overhead in T. We also want the prover not to be crazy inefficient. Then the day we want people to to really delegate their computation. And the cloud, even though he's powerful, you know, he can't run in time two to the million. So he shouldn't be too inefficient. And in our language, we think of it as, you know, the proof of running time polynomial overhead on top of running the computation itself. So poly and T. And second order, less important, but still, ideally we want the communication complexity to be very small as well, ideally polylog T. So this is kind of a guideline for the efficiency guarantee that we want, we want to achieve. And now let's try to do it, to match this. So now we're armed with, you know, uh, what we've seen in the first part of the talk, interactive proofs, multiple interactive proofs. Let's try to use that to delegate computation. So we saw classical proofs won't work. Let's go with interactive proofs. Let's do that first, see where we get. Okay, so let's try to delegate a computation via an interactive proof. So now the cloud will give the output y of the computation. There'll be a lot of communication back and forth, and the uh, uh, verifier, the smartwatch, will be convinced that the computation is correct. As we saw, we can do this where the smartwatch, the verifier, runs in time proportional to the space of the computation, the space it takes to compute the function f. Okay, so the um, weak device runs in time space, so it's okay for you know, uh, small space computations. What about the cloud here? So if you take the classical results of IP equals P space, this is the reference to this, to this theorem of Shamir down there, turns out that the cloud, the prover, actually is really inefficient. Its runtime is two to the space squared. Okay, so even if, this, even if uh, the space is log T, still it's super polynomial in T, the overhead. Okay, so not so good. So what can we do? This is what we want. What we want is to say, okay, the verifier runs in time space, the cloud prover runs in time t with polynomial overheads. 
Okay? We don't know how to get this. Okay? This is an open problem. So I was told once that you know, every good talk should have one good open problem, one proof, and one joke. Ideally, the joke does not intersect with the proof or the open problem. So this is my open problem. Uh, I think it's a great problem. Uh, it's a very fundamental. You know, is proving really necessarily hard, harder than computing in this setting? So we don't know. But let me tell you a few words about what we do know. So we made some progress towards this question. We know, that it, we know how to do it for bounded depth. So if instead of looking at the space of the computation, think of the depth of the computation. So what is the depth? So what we know, so what, what is the depth? If you think of uh, the computation as a circuit, arithmetic circuit or a Boolean circuit, doesn't matter, the depth is the number of layers. So the depth kind of corresponds to how efficiently you can parallelize the computation. So for, uh, for computations that are very highly parallelized, that are highly parallelizable, that's the word, uh, we have great delegation schemes. Okay, we also know, this is a very recent work, beautiful work by the uh, triple R's, um, that we actually have one for a bounded space as well, but unfortunately the runtime of the um, verifier is not S, but it's X time T to the epsilon where epsilon is a constant. And it has to be a constant. If it's more than a constant, there's other, the round complexities, there's some blow up in two to the one over epsilon. So, uh, so it's not quite what we want, which is this, but it makes progress. So I'm going to leave this open problem to smart people like you to solve, and instead I'm going to say, let's even, you know, why, why actually be stuck in space, in bounded space? Let's go beyond bounded space computations. I want all computations. Okay. If I want all computations, I can't be in the interactive proof setting because there I know it, we must be bounded space because IP equals P space. So let's go to the multi-prover interactive proof setting. So let's try to borrow ideas from here. Remember we said here, sorry, this is really cut off, but the important parts are, are in the first two lines. Uh, so remember we, we said that any t-time computation actually has an interactive proof. Oh, it is cut off, sorry. The prover runs in time poly t. The verifier you cannot see, but runs with only poly log overhead. So we really have the result we want, the only problem is, we ha in the delegation setting, we have one cloud, and here you have, in this result, you have two clouds that don't interact. So it's not really our setting. And as I said before, the fact that they have two non-interacted, two clouds with kind of a wall between them is what gives this model its power. So it's not clear how to use this in our setting. Nevertheless, it turns out you can use it. And what you can do, you can take this model, sprinkle kind of crypto magic on it, and convert it to a, a delegation protocol. But actually what I'm going to show you today, and this was already done in the early 90s by Kilian and Mikali. But what I'm going to show, and this results in an interactive protocol. What I'm going to show you today actually is not this, but I'm going to show you even more. I'm going to show you, oh, sorry, one thing before. Actually, at this point, uh, you should kind of be a little alarmed because I said that if I'm in the interactive proof setting, I can only do bounded space. And I'm saying I can do anything uh, with crypto magic. So what is this magic that uh, kind of weird? So I should say, how do we use this crypto magic to get, over, to get around the bounded space? We relax the soundness requirement. So instead of, uh, instead of requiring no cloud can cheat whatsoever, we, rec we require that only computationally bounded clouds cannot cheat. In other words, what we say, as long as you can't factor a thousand digit integers, then so the only way you can cheat is by factoring my huge, you know, gigantic uh, RSA number. 
or the only way you can cheat is by solving this very hard, worst case hard lattice problem, or something of that sort. Okay, by breaking a widely believed cryptographic assumption. So that's how uh, we g get around this. Okay, but what I want to uh, focus on today is even getting more. Here's what I want to show you. What I want to show you is that if you add in addition some ideas, if you borrow ideas from quantum mechanics, then what you can get is again a, a delegation scheme, still computationally sound as before, but now only two messages where actually the first message is even independent of the computation. And what's interesting here is you can think of this proof as completely non-interactive. You know, the queries here can be thought of some public parameters and because they're independent of the computation. And now we're kind of back in the original classical proof that we all love. Proof is just a message. But it's not quite, because actually, if you're all powerful, you can cheat. And this proof kind of depends on the public parameters or in the query here. But we get back to the non-interactive setting, which is actually important for some applications. For example, in blockchain application, for example, this is very important, the fact that it's non-interactive. Or there are some applications that the non-interactive version is actually crucial. OK, so how, how do we get, how do we, uh, how do we sprinkle all this magic to get, to get down there? OK, so the, um, Construction itself, actually, uses only crypto magic. The quantum part comes in the analysis. Okay, so let, now we can put the quantum later and let's just look at the crypto. Okay, how we use cryptography to go from two provers to a single prover. And this is a heuristic that was suggested by Bill Mayer and, Wat and Wetzel, and here it is. Here's what they say. Take the two prover interactive proof I'm thinking of two for simplicity, you can think of more, but two, the theorems I gave you before were true for two, so you didn't need more, so and it's convenient to uh, draw. Okay, so take your two proof of interactive proof, and here's the idea, very simple. Just give the one cloud the two queries. But if you give him the two queries in the clear, just like that, he can very easily cheat, because as we said, it's kind of a consistency check, because if he cheats, cheats the check, he'll cheat. So instead, what you do, encrypt them. Give him the queries encrypted. So he doesn't see anything. Well, if he doesn't see, how can he compute? Oh, well, for that, we have fully homomorphic encryption. Fully homomorphic encryption allows you to do exactly that. It allow, it, on the one hand, it hides, like encryption. On the other hand, it allows you to compute unencrypted data. So the cloud who sees the, um, the purple box, the encrypted Q1, he does not know what Q1 is, but he can kind of blindly compute the answer on this encryption. Hence, similarly for Q2, he sees the encryption of Q2, he does not know what it is, but he can compute the answer without knowing anything. This is exactly what fully homomorphic encryption allows you to do. This is the scheme. You start with an MIP, you just send the two queries encrypted, each one under kind of an independent secret key. So you have a, a secret key for Q1, you have a secret key for Q2, different secret keys. You send encrypted queries, you get encrypted answers, you decrypt, and you verify as if you were the verifier in the MIP. MIP, short for multi prover interactive proofs. That's it. That's the scheme. And now the question, well, is it sound? Let me first convince you that it's sound. Okay, believe me, here's how it goes. Look, what can a cheating cloud do? He sees, when he computes on Q1, because the keys are independent, when he tries to compute on Q1, the Q2 box is locked. It's closed. He, well, it's not, if it was a real, you know, physical box, clearly he can't do anything. That box is locked, it's black, he can't see anything. It's not, a, it's not a physical block, it's, a, it's not a physical box, it's a digital one, right? So it's, he sees a bunch of bits, garbage bits. But these are garbage bits, how can they help him? Clearly he can't do anything with them, so he probably just does some local computation on Q1 and local computation on Q2, but you know, with local computations you can't cheat, so he cannot cheat. 
That's the idea. And actually, let me tell you, there was actually a proof along the lines that I just said, uh, proof of soundness. But this proof of soundness was not sound. And actually, it was later published in two works showing, actually, there are counterexamples. There are actually examples of an MIP that's sound, and when you apply this transformation, you get something that is not sound. OK. What went wrong? OK, and here comes the connection to quantum. So what went wrong? So let's see. In an MIP, a multi-proof interactive proof, what is the soundness guarantee that we have? The soundness guarantee that you have is it sound as long as the cheating provers behave locally. What does local mean? A1 is only a function of Q1. A2 is only a function of Q2. All under that conditions, you cannot cheat. What's going on in our setting with encryptions? Well, you, you, the cloud is giving these two boxes, these two encrypted queries. It seems like all he can do is kind of compute independently on each one. If he does this, it will be secure. But in reality, I don't know, he can do more. Not clear, not clear what, right? But it turns out, look, this is really not the same thing. And now you can say, OK, but what can he really do? To, and what he can do is something that was already uh, termed by Einstein as being spooky interactions. That's the connection to physics. So now let me be a little more precise in what can he do in terms of the encryption, in terms of my language. So what is the soundness guarantee? What does the encryption promise us? As we said, if there were no encryption, it's not sound. But there is an encryption. And what does this encryption promise us? It doesn't promise us that the cheating prover behaves locally. We don't have that guarantee. If we had that guarantee, it would be sound. But the only guarantee that we get from the fully homomorphic encryption is that, well, answer one, so the um, purple answer, should not signal any information. It should not reveal any information about the other query, about the blue query. Because if it would, then you can kind of break the encryption scheme. And similarly, A2, the answer 2, should not reveal any information about query 1, besides what is already known from query 2. So in other words, from the answers, the answers should not signal information about the query that's blocked, about the query that is locked. That's what the encryption promises you. And this is exactly what's called non-signaling strategies in quantum mechanics. So I'm going to explain this a bit more formally in the next slide. But I'm happy, actually, that this part is cut, because I didn't really want to talk about it. So, uh, uh, and we can move on. No, OK, so the uh, there said, well, almost exactly the same. Not quite. I, I cheated a little bit uh, in what I said there. And the, what I cheated is, in the encryption setting, it's not true that A1 doesn't signal or doesn't reveal information about query 2. It doesn't reveal information about query 2 to a polynomial time uh, observer. If you're all, if you're all powerful observer, actually query um, answer 1 can actually be the encryption of query 2. It can, the answer can just be encryption of query 2, which he knows. So the, uh, the no signaling here is kind of a computational setting. And whoop, it went away. Because I'm not going to actually make this distinction in this talk. It's kind of technical. But everything I say works in the computational setting. And it's kind of a technicality that I prefer to shove underneath the rug because it's not very interesting. Uh, OK, so let's see exactly what this non-signaling is. But the point is that was noticed, or that we noticed, is that what we need is actually not classical uh, MIP in order for this transformation to work. What we need is non-signaling MIPs. 
And what is an unsigned MIP? It's one where soundness holds, not when there's a wall, but rather soundness holds against any non-signaling strategy. So what is, what is a non-signaling strategy? So a non-signaling strategy is something that was defined in the mid-80s by quantum physicists. And uh, what, in a, in a non-signaling strategy, you think of the adversary, the cheating prover, he can see both queries. There's no wall, he can see both queries. But his hands are tied. He can't do whatever he wants. He can answer A1 and A2 can be a randomized function of both queries, but subject to the constraint that A1 should not reveal information about the other query, Q2, beyond what is already revealed in Q, Q1. So in other words, and, vice, and also A2 with, Q, with uh, uh, Q1, so yeah, both sides. In other words, the cheating provers here are not restricted to behave locally, like in classical MAP. The only constraint that we're putting on them is that they cannot transfer information. Okay, so kind of think of the two provers, you know, one in Mars and one is in uh, Earth, and they need to, you know, they can't kind of transfer information uh, between them because, the, you know, they can't compu communicate faster than the speed of light. And that's the only restriction we're putting on them. Otherwise, they can use quantum mechanics, they can use whatever else they have. As long as, you know, they cannot uh, break the principle of uh, communicating faster than the speed of light. So that's a non-signaling, that's the definition of non-signaling strategies and, and a high level. So what we observe is, if, if you had an MIP that is sound, against such strategies, that you cannot cheat with a non-signaling strategy, then this is sound, this is secure, we're done. And the next thing we do is actually construct such an MIP that is secure, is sound against non-signaling strategies. So, the part on top is actually quite technical and I'm not going to talk about today. Uh, one thing that I do want to mention in this MIP that we construct, the two queries are really independent of the computation, like I promised. And that's the case actually in all MIPs I'm aware of. So it's not a property of our specific MIP. Uh, all MIPs I'm aware of, the queries are independent of the computation. They only depend on the time bound T. And I said also I promised you one proof. So here's, a, well, here's the fake theorem, and here comes the fake proof. Uh, fake because I'm hiding a lot of things under the rug. But let me try to prove to you that if you did have an MIP that's secure, that's sound, against non-singing strategies, then indeed the delegation scheme below is sound. Okay, so here's the proof overview. The idea is the following. Suppose for the sake of contradiction that there's a cheating cloud in my delegation scheme that can cheat. He can give the wrong answer and he gets, two you know, he gets these two encrypted queries, he can choose the wrong answer, uh, the, the wrong, he gives the wrong computation value and manages to convince you with, these, with this proof. The first observation is that, well, because the MIP is sound against non-signaling strategy, it must be the case that if you look at this, that either A1 does signal information about Q2, or A2, answer two, does a signal information about query one. If they both didn't signal information, then we have a non-signaling strategy that cheats in the MIP. So one of them must signal information, but if it signals information, we can use that to break the encryption scheme. Because the other query is encrypted in a completely fresh independent keys. And you should not be able to signal any information about that encrypted query. That gives, that's exactly what uh, uh, encryption scheme, the guarantee you get from an encryption scheme. That's it. So this part is kind of the intuitive and easy one. Actually constructing the MIP above 
is where kind of most of the work is. Okay, so let me kind of summarize uh, what, what I've said so far. So we want to delegate, so we started with, uh, you know, classical proofs, which we only have for, you know, functions in NP. Then we move to the interactive proof setting that contain all bounded space computation, and we actually have delegation uh, schemes with sufficient prover in some of these cases. We can't do it for all, you know, bounded space computation, but we showed some examples where we can. And then we defined the MIP setting, which you can, all, you can do all computations you want with, you know, the verifier only runs in polylogarithmic overhead. The provers here, the provers here are efficient. Everything's great, but we can't really, we don't really know how to use it to get non-interactive delegation. But then we showed, well, if we construct them to be sound against non-signaling strategies, then the delegation scheme we get below is sound. So this is kind of an overview of today's talk. I want to point out a few things. So first, there's a lot of, this is kind of the basics. There's a lot of follow-up work after that that I didn't mention, but it is in the manuscript uh, for the ICM uh, that I wrote. And uh, extensions of this includes, so first here, the, all the computations we think of are deterministic computation. There's a lot of work on non-deterministic uh, computations. Um, also here, we only talked about delegating functions. There's some work on delegating memory as well that I didn't talk about. And also there's a lot of work on trying to optimize the parameters and get really efficient uh, schemes. And I want to end by saying, that actually this, this general area of delegating computation has been a really successful area in terms of bridging uh, theory and practice. There's been a lot of uh, uh, systems that have been built based on these delegation schemes. And I, I did a quick kind of look. I'm sure I missed some, but here are a few of the systems I found on implementation of these various kind of theoretical uh, delegation schemes. And, uh, oh, they're even used on the blockchain. Okay, thank you. Questions? Sorry, so, so where in the blockchain is used? Oh, <laughs> so it's, uh, there is in some of the cryptos, there, okay, there is a few kind of on it their way, but one of them that's used, uh, that I know of, currently used, is uh, there's a company called Zcash that they use uh, proofs. They, they want to um, do, uh, they want crypto, their cryptocurrency is anonymous, so they don't want to know, they want to hide who's doing the transaction, and they have kind of a proof that, you know, the that what you're doing is consistent. So they use delegation uh, there. And there's a few more that I think in the pipeline coming out. Yeah. Any other question? Yes. Oh. So uh, the current FHE schemes are very inefficient. So how come we have applications already? OK, so good. Uh, so let me actually say about this. So first, I kind of lied. Uh, you don't really need the full power of FHE, uh, what you can use much less than FHE. You can use what's called a computational peer scheme. But let me also say that for such computations that are very, very shallow, um, I didn't quite explain why they're shallow, but let me just say for such computation, even if you use an FHE schemes, uh, the FHE scheme we have are actually pretty efficient. And they've been, now they have, we have libraries and they've been implemented and for very shallow computations. And we can make these computations shallow with some pre-processing. I didn't get into the, the details, but um, you can make them relatively efficient. But a lot of the, um, the implementation schemes that I have, a lot of them are based on the information theoretical uh, results uh, and the IP setting. But some are based on the, um, on the a, MIP setting, um, uh, where they actually don't use fully homomorphic encryption. They use kind of linear only and make everything linear in a way. Um, so the, the implementations are not one-to-one uh, -one with the 
theoretical results, they do a lot of optimization and, and yeah. So um, in quantum mechanics, the reason we know the world is quantum mechanical is, and not classical is because we have Bell's inequalities yeah. that you know flow from the from the locality of the theory. Is there some sort of Bell's inequality for uh, your no signaling solver? It's an interesting question. So I don't I don't think there's a you know. Um, it's more than Bell inequality. What, what's for us encryption? Encryption really translates one to one with non-signaling. It really, it, what encryption gives you is really non-signaling. It's um, there. I, I think of them as so. In general, when I do cryptography, uh, cryptography, there's a lot of magic in it. And what what's for me has worked is I try to strip off the crypto and have the information theoretic object in front of me and study that because the cryptography can really make things blind you a little bit. And I think when you do that with encryption, what you get is non-signaling. It's an information theory, theoretic argument, I mean, information theoretic construct of non-signaling strategy. So it's beyond just Bell inequalities. It's any not, you can essentially maybe do any non-signaling. Uh, and by the way, I, I think that this is kind of tight, that it's like we even have a black box impossibility result showing that if you can't convert anything that, if you have a proof, like um, black box proof of security, which kind of, if, if you have a natural proof of security for, for the delegation, for any kind of delegation scheme, you must have started with uh, MIP that secure against non-signaling. It's not. It's like the other direction also holds. So it's really one and the same in my in my mind. Yeah. Anybody else? No. Thank you very much. So thanks for all the speakers and everybody for coming.